Okay, two quick things. One, I know this does not look like a tutorial, but I promise you it is. See, I shot this exposed for the highlights because I wanted to see if we could use the HDR color wheels in DaVinci Resolve in order to bring everything back to the way it's supposed to look. Also, I think I'm gonna start a vlog with the Pocket 6K. Let me know in the comments what you think. Let's go get started. So these are the HDR color wheels or HDR color palette. Now this is exciting for a couple reasons. First of all, because, well, it's new, which I know sounds stupid, but hear me out. For the longest time, basically since the dawn of digital editing, we have been stuck with the same basic tools for color grading, and that have been the color wheels and the curves. I'm sure you've got masking and power windows and all that stuff, but when it comes down to it, your two main tools for color grading has always been those wheels, and those curves. And now we've got something new with more flexibility, more functionality, and just a whole new world of possibilities, which is the other reason why this is so exciting. Now, I'm not gonna go into the super nitty gritty details of how this all works and the science behind it and all that stuff. If you want all those details, I recommend clicking the link in the description to my friend Darren's video on these HDR color wheels because it's just a really good video and it will actually really explain better what these things do. What I'm gonna do is just kind of give you the crash course and how these work and show you my workflow. All right, let's start out with a tour of the HDR color palette. To get to the color palette, all you have to do is click on this logo right here, which looks just like the Color Wheels logo with the letters HDR. Now this is not just for HDR Rec 2020 color grading. You can use this in standard dynamic range as well. So I, I don't know, maybe HDR wasn't the best name. Maybe it should be like wide dynamic range because it's just really good for any footage that has a wide dynamic range like the clip we're working with today. So the first thing that you'll notice is that we've actually got six color wheels here instead of the standard three that you get with the classic color wheel. So instead of lift gamma gain or shadows, midtones, and highlights, you've actually got blacks, dark, shadow, and then if we come up here, we've got light, highlight, specular, and then obviously we've got the global wheel as well. Now, if you don't wanna use the global wheel, which I highly suggest using it, by the way, I'll show you why in a second. What you can do is actually expand this whole high dynamic range tool by clicking this little box with the arrow and that'll bring up your little tonal range map. And you can come over to these three dots and click bank global with color wheels. That'll get rid of your global wheel and you'll actually get four wheels at a time here instead of the standard three. But like I said, I typically use that global wheel. So we're gonna keep that there. And the next thing that I want to point out is that each one of these color wheels has a lot more functionality than the standard color wheels. So instead of just having the color and the exposure, you can actually do the color, the exposure, the roll off of each different tonal range. Let's go ahead and reset that. And you also have more saturation control, which is really nice. And then this is cool. This is actually a new way of navigating these color wheels here. So instead of having to drag this dot around, what I can do is I can drag the X over towards blue. Let's say I wanna make that more teal. I can take Y and I can drag that towards green. And now we've got more of a teal color there. And then this slider here will actually reposition the start point of each tonal range. So you'll see as I slide this over to the right on my little zone map, you can see that the shadows are starting in a different place. Then to reset it, I just hit this little circular arrow right there and we're back to where we started. And then on top of that, we've got things like temperature, tint, hue, contrast, pivot, midtone detail, and black offset, which is gonna be very, very important to us coming up here soon. Now, like I said, we've got six different tonal zones here, but if we needed more, if we needed even more adjustment and more flexibility and the ability to really dial things in, we could could, if we wanted, create a new zone and we could title it something, let's say test zone, 
and then we can decide if we want to put it in our shadow area or our highlight area because the shadows actually contain the darks and the blacks and the lights actually contain the highlights and the specular. So we basically have those two main zones and then each one of those main zones has two sub zones. Does that make sense? That makes sense, right? And over here in the zone map, you can do a bunch of different stuff. You can disable and re-enable each one of those zones. You can also change the starting point of those zones and you can increase and decrease the fall off of each zone. So you can see we've kind of got unlimited possibilities here and we can really have the potential to dial in the look that we want. These almost act like a super advanced version of the log wheels in the sense that when you adjust a certain tonal range, it doesn't have as much bleed through to the other tonal ranges as the traditional color wheels do. Now, there might be a right and a wrong way to do this. I don't know. I've basically just watched a couple YouTube tutorials and other than that, for the most part, I've kind of just started playing around with it and discovered a workflow that works for me. And that's honestly what you should do with anything video editing related. You should just play around with it and figure out what works for you. Hopefully, my workflow will be a good starting point. So let's just jump into that. So the first thing that we need to do is change some of our project settings. If we come into our settings and we go to color management, by default, our color science is gonna be DaVinci YRGB. Our timeline color space is gonna be Rec 709 Gamma 2.4. Now that will work. This will work. You can use the HDR color palette with this setup, but you're not really gonna get the full weight, the full advantage of that HDR color palette in this color space. So we wanna actually put our footage into a wider color space. And to do that, what we're gonna do is change our color science to DaVinci YRGB Color Managed. And we're going to change our Resolve Color Management preset to DaVinci Wide Gamut, which is a brand new color space added to DaVinci Resolve 17. It's a larger color space and it works for standard dynamic range and high dynamic range footage. They basically, what, what they say when they're advertising it is that it's future proofing your videos, which, you know, I'm a big fan of. And then our output color space is going to stay Rec. 709 Gamma 2.4. Let's come down and hit save. Now I'm shooting Blackmagic RAW and for some reason when you're shooting Blackmagic RAW and you change to that DaVinci wide gamut and do all the stuff that we just did, it automatically puts your footage into kind of a Rec. 709 color space. So if that happens to you, don't freak out. It's supposed to do that. For some reason it doesn't do that with regular log footage. I'm not sure why. So. There are some things you need to do in order to use the HDR color palette with regular log footage. For now, let's stick with the raw and uh, and get going with this workflow. So the next thing that I wanna do is actually determine which parts of my image are lying in which tonal range. So let's come over to our HDR color palette. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna come to this little circle here that's at the top left of each color wheel. And we're just gonna click on it to see which parts of our image are being controlled by which color wheel. So we've got our blacks and that's basically just the darkest parts of my hoodie, some parts of the deck and that's basically it. And then we've come to darks. We've got the inside of my mouth, some parts of my face, a little bit more of the deck and some of the grass. And then in shadows, now we're starting to see something. We've got even more of the deck, parts of the fence, even more of that yard, a little bit more of my face actually a lot more of my face. And then if we come up to our lighter wheels, let's go to light and that's got the rest of my face and also the entire background as well as the rest of that fence. And then highlight is basically just the fence and the background. And then if we come over to specular, it's just that small part of the sky and then that white fence. All right. So the next thing we're going to do is make sure that the subject of our video is actually exposed properly. And I like using the global wheel for this. This is why we, I said to keep the global wheel around because what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up the exposure 
of that global wheel until I am properly exposed. And that looks pretty good right about there. And then the next thing we're gonna do is just go tonal range by tonal range and adjust each one of these exposures until we like what we see. So we'll start up here at the specular. Bring that down. Let's go move on to the highlights and start bringing that down. That's looking okay. And so when we're bringing this background down, we wanna make sure that we're not like interfering with the face too much because the face kind of lies within the shadows and the lights as at the same time. So if we mess around with things too much, it's gonna make our face look really, really weird. So let's go ahead and actually move on to those lights and bring those down a little bit. Not too much or else the face is going to start looking weird. That's looking good. So now you can see already the background, it doesn't have as much contrast as it did before, but we do have all of the details there, which is really nice. And we'll fix some of that contrast a little bit later in our grade. For now, let's just move on to our shadows, our darks and our blacks. Let's go with the shadows first. Actually, I think our shadows are probably pretty good. Let's move on to the darks. We're gonna bring our darks down, make this as contrasty as possible. That's looking pretty good right there. And then we're going to bring, finally, our blacks down. I think we've got a pretty good image here. When we were exposed in the face, a lot better than we were before. Our background is completely there. We've got details back in the fence. You can see the shadows of the fence posts. That looks really, really good. Let's do a quick before and after. There's before. So we're completely underexposed in the face and we've lost a lot of detail in the hoodie and we have a very contrasted background. And then with the magic of our color wheels, everything's exposed properly together, which is really nice. And that's reflected over here in our scopes as well. So moving on, the next thing that I wanna do is actually change the colors around in here. My face is very, very cool. I wanna warm that up a little bit and actually make it look like skin that's alive. I knew this would happen too, because you know I was facing a wall a white wall that was reflecting onto my face. I was in the shade. So of course, this was going to be very shady. We do not like that. So let's go ahead and actually start with that. We are going to add a little bit of warmth to our shadows. So let's come down here to our X value and just start dragging it to the left. And that's pretty decent right there. That already looks a lot better. Maybe bring our Y value up towards the red and increase the saturation. And that's looking a lot better. That's looking a lot more like skin. I mean, it looked like skin before, but it looked like cold, pale, dead skin. Now we've got some life in it. This is, this is coming along nicely. Now to offset some of the warmth that we put in the shadows, we're actually going to go the opposite way in the darks and we're going to cool things off just a little bit. So let's go to the darks and we are going to drag the X value to the right and down towards the green. We're gonna bring that Y to the left down towards the green. That's looking pretty good right there. And let's see, what else do I wanna do? I'd like to actually add a little bit of that same teal color to the highlights. So let's go ahead and move on to our light highlight and specular. And we're going to push this a little bit farther because we're gonna bring a little bit more color to that sky. So let's go ahead and drag the X value to the right and bring that Y value towards the green. And that's looking pretty good right there. Last thing that I wanna do is come over to my blacks and I'm going to desaturate my blacks completely. And then the last thing that I'm gonna do is actually change my black point because I like having that kind of muted look and to do that, you kind of raise the black point up a little bit while adding contrast in the shadows. So let's go ahead and get our black offset and drag that up. And what I'm aiming for is this second dash above zero in my scopes. And that's looking pretty good right there. Let's go ahead and do a before and after. 
Now, if I really felt the need to, which I don't hear because I'm very, very happy with this, but what I could do if I wanted was actually move some of these tonal ranges around to change the look a little bit more and really dial in the contrast that I'm looking for. But like I said, the what I did before is really, really good enough. And that's kind of my base color grade right there. And then after that, I just have to maybe correct the skin tones a little bit, add a little bit of a vignette. And before you know it, with much less nodes than my original color grading workflow, this thing is looking really, really good. So one other thing that I wanna show you real quick, I'm gonna open up my clips here and I'm gonna to go to this piece of log footage. This is 10-bit 422S-Log3 from the A7S3. And even with these same project settings with that DaVinci wide gamut and all of that, we're still getting that log profile here. It's not automatically changing to a Rec 709 color space. And so what we actually need to do here in order to use this HDR color palette is we actually need to add our contrast and saturation before we do that. So let's come over, I'll show you what I mean. We just gotta add some contrast here. So just pull that up, maybe bring that overall exposure up a little bit and then bring up our saturation. And then from there, we can go into our HDR color palette and start messing around. But you see, see, still even now, we're not getting the full benefit of six tonal ranges here. We can still play around with it, but for whatever reason, we don't have the same flexibility that we do with RAW. So I think that this was something that was really actually made for working with RAW, working with Rec 2020, working with things that have a super wide dynamic dynamic range. Now, the A7S III does have a super wide dynamic range, so I'm not sure what the deal is. I'm going to do some more research, keep an eye on my community tab. If I figure that out, I'll let you know. And speaking of a wide dynamic range, obviously using the HDR color palette is going to work a lot better if you're working with something like Log or Raw or something that's super flexible in post. If I was using say 8-bit 420 1080p footage it's h.264 compression it wasn't it wouldn't work because you're working with less colors and less compression and you you know what i actually just put out a video about that so go ahead and check that out right here and for more tools tips and tricks that'll make you a better video editor make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit that bell so you don't miss anything thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.